My name is Monk Rowe for a revisit with Bobby Shu. Uh, I should tell our listeners that we had an earlier gathering and the tech uh, spirits were not with us. <laughs> or they were with us. I'm not sure which. The tech so, spirits, I like that. We'll see how it goes today. So I wanted to start out with a quote from a wise man uh, who said regarding jazz playing, the ultimate goal is to play by ear and feel. Human spirit and emotion needs to be free to express itself. Who said that? You did. Oh, did I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it sounds exactly like something I would say. <laughs> I get so perturbed sometimes, you know. And, you know, I guess I'm, I probably, I don't mean to be an elitist or anything about, about this music, but I care more about this music than I could even, you know, with all the dictionaries that I own and everything, I don't think I could come up with the words to express my, the depth of my emotional feelings for this music. It's not just music to me, it's, it's something greater than that. It's religion, it's philosophy, it's, it's a way of life, it's, um, it's the connection to the full meaning of my life ever since I was when I found out about improvisation, it wasn't, I always liked music as a kid, you know, when my parents, when my grandmother and my mom played old 78 albums, things like that. It was mostly Guy Lombardo and Wayne King. <laughs> there was one Harry James 78 yeah. there, you know, but I had no clue who Harry James was. At right. All. You didn't, you didn't think of this as like really sweet stuff. No, <laughs> no I was just, it was music. They loved music and they played music in the house. Uh, fairly regularly. I mean, the, one of the big things that I always recalled was that on Sunday nights that I remember, as the best I remember it, there was a thing called the Bell Telephone Hour, I believe. And uh, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, I think it was a New York Philharmonic or something like that that, was, that played. It was a New York Symphony Orchestra. And my, uh, my grandmother and my mom, they liked Mario Lanza, Great Caruso, things like that. They liked the opera kind of thing, you know, and uh, so they would listen to classical music on Sunday and uh, we would like, well, I would be, I would probably no more than a year and a half or something old, I lay it on a little blanket in a diaper, you know, but uh, <laughs> we, they, we listened to that music every, and my, I had an uncle, Tom, who also loved classical music. So we'd gather around in the living room and listen to this thing every Sunday night. And I, I just remember lay, laying there and listening. But the first one that hit my hit me in like a bong in the head was when they did uh, Peter and the Wolf. And I was probably maybe about two or two and a half years old when I heard that. And that a bassoon could be a duck. I thought, wow, that is the hippest thing in the world, you know, <laughs> or whatever. What yes. that, that instruments could become animals. and this suddenly this there was this whole kind of thing happened in my head like a it, it added meaning to it. it wasn't just sounds it added it had visual characteristics character that a storyline and everything you know and uh, I, I for whatever reason i i really for to this very day i can almost go back to that moment on the floor and remember that i mean hmm. that's weird yeah um <laughs> i had a I had an experience like that at, at Boy Scout camp with a visiting troupe and some song they did with rhythms that I'd never heard before. And I was wondering if you've ever had a student who could play technically really well, but just seemed devoid of what you're describing, that the music had no depth or emotion behind it. Well, if I, I don't think there's enough paper on this planet to make a list of those people who I've run across in my life. It, it's like the most common thing that you see. And it's one of the, uh, the kind of little personal gripes that I rabble rouse about in, in the field of education in the, in the fact that, that it's all become too greatly influenced. And I think from the books, some of the books that I've read 
try to go back in history at several hundred years to where uh, it became like a difficult situation for court trumpeters, say, for instance, mm -hmm. to have to do a fanfare when a visiting king and queen came in. And if you if your chops were not in good shape and you clammed a few like there, smear a couple <laughs> of them on the wall, the castle wall, well, some, I read a thing in an ITG thing years and years ago where they some research they actually decapitated uh, court trumpeters sometimes if they did a poor performance. So when you go back four, five, six hundred years, you know, in medieval times and stuff, when there, who was making, there was not even a trumpet. It was they ripped a horn off of a rhinoceros or something, mm -hmm. you know, and it blew on a, an animal horn. And I mean, and even when they started making instruments out of out of metal and things it was the blacksmith when he finished with a set of horseshoes he'd make you a trumpet or a mouthpiece or something you know so i mean the quality wasn't there and i mean you uh, could you imagine i mean if you, for a trumpet player to, to pick up a piece of garbage that was made by a blacksmith in between a couple of horses you know i mean i don't think you're going to work carnegie hall on that yeah you know? no. I mean, and you know so the point being that that this whole history of of fear of making a mistake, this right and wrong issue, which um, it's it's something aside from music, it's deeply embedded in the the uh, it's deeply embedded in the subconscious mind in the genomes of humanity, of, of civilization. Every person on the planet goes back far enough in civilization. We've try to survive you know and yeah it's 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 a pro and con of survival you know and so if if you the issue of right and wrong is like a gigantic social button that can get pushed and what happens is it it, it stimulates i mean i'm not a great a psychologist but i studied i took two years of psychology in high school because i couldn't get into the class i wanted turned out to be the best mistake I ever made was mm -hmm. to, to study psychology. And once I got out of, I, when I got into college, I signed up for it again because I said, oh, God, I got to keep studying this stuff. And it, there's this thing, it, it stimulates like the, the amygdala part of the brain, which is the fear factor thing. And so- You had, you had shared um, a little lesson that I'd like to hear about again. And that was, getting your students to play an F scale. Oh, yeah. With... Oh, yeah. Well, the thing is, here's the bottom line for me and what I was delving into. And I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a, you, you'd know that I kissed the Blarney Stone at one point, you know, over there, mm -hmm. because I have this, this gabbing kind of gift that I keep going, but I take these asides in conversation quite often. But the thing about it was I was getting at is that Music is basically an emotional thing. It's not supposed to be just a clinical, don't miss a note kind of thing. And that's what's happened to music education over the years to a point where, you know, you sit in and when you, you, take, you take a lesson, what are you doing? The guy makes you play a page until you don't miss a note in it. Well, you miss the whole point of why are you playing it? Where's the emotion? Where's the, the joy? Where's the humanity of this? the real meaning behind music, you know, it's not even there. And most of the teachers are not even aware of it because it's like the contagion of aberration, they call it. It's one generation after another, you keep passing on, you know, uh, a kind of a attitude about music and you get into a concert band and the band directors, all oh, it's about just play this until we don't miss any notes. And you get in an orchestra, and how uptight is that? You know, you get a guy like Ozawa in front of an orchestra, for Christ's sake, everybody's like dropping volumes every 10 minutes, you know. I, yes, I've often wondered why nobody in an orchestra seems to ever smile. Yeah, hell no, their, their life is on the line at all times. You know, I've known, I won't mention any, any names here because I love them, but I know some very prominent orchestral people, not only trumpet players, but others too, that live and die by that sword. They sit there and they 
practice they're in constant sweating and if especially if it's a long period where they can't play for they got tacit sheets and they got to wait out for 400 measures during a violin yes solo or something right. and then you got to suddenly come in and it's marcato and it's da -da, and you got to come in and hit a high d or something and all you you sit there and and you start worrying about that the future is like looming at you and it's like dragons on your shoulders and stuff you know and then there, you look up there there's a little ozawa up there like glaring at everybody and oh for christ's sake you know I, well, you, I swear to you, but the whole point about it is that when I teach, uh, when I teach, <laughs> teach and I use quotes around that word because I don't really, I just try to inspire more than anything. Mm -hmm. But the whole idea is I try to make sure that people understand the value of playing everything with some emotion in it. And that little example, I think the story that you did, you, uh, are referring to as a it's a kind of a little it's a it's just a little make the game i play when i do a lecture on improvisation or something but it's not only about improvisation it's just picking up the horn and playing period but it is that you know you can pretend i pick three three uh, emotions uh sorrow angry and uh, happy and i haven't played the you know play the scale like sorrowfully like and i say pretend that the neighbor ran over your cat you know and oh my god i love that cat now and get some ooh, get that emotion going i love that cat now play that scale thinking about your favorite cat and try to make sure that the way you approach that scale it's not like da -da 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 -da. that's not sorrowful that's you know emotion has to do with a vibration in the body and everything and you get down into sorrow and apathy and things like that. Oh, it goes very slow. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're if you're angry, if you say that neighbor, I'm gonna son of God, I'm gonna kill him for he drives like an idiot. I'm gonna he ran over my cat. I'm gonna kill him now. Play that scale. I don't hurt her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> baseball bat, you know, to the head. Okay. Then you say, wait a minute, that's not my cat. Then now you play a happy. And so just as a it's I, it's a silly example but it gets the point across very easily not only to children but to adults as well who sit there and say god what have i been doing all these years you know yeah you know yeah. you open up the arvin book and you play scales and stuff you're just all you're doing is trying to accumulate huge amounts of technical facility in hopes and your and when your attention is on at you in the practice room what is your goal damn i hope i don't miss any notes here today yes. you know, you know? Did, did you have um with the with the big bands you played with uh which included woody herman and goodman and toshiko and louis belson did they have did any of them have leadership qualities that you either resented or admired <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> okay, you don't get away with just a yes no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, all of them had some I, I think the biggest the biggest idiot that I ever worked for and one of the most difficult people and I'm not the only person who would tell you this. This has been written up in books was Benny Goodman. Uh, he was an extremely difficult person. I think even his daughter, I remember in a, an interview never understood her father. He was like, I don't know, in those days, we didn't know what the term bipolar meant, you know, it mm -hmm. was not a, a term that was around. I I would guess almost that, that Benny had some bipolar things or some schizophrenia thing, because you could never quite figure out why he had to be so nasty and so mean and so um, condescending to people, like the people that worked with him. He was racist. I remember Buddy Tate, we did one time when Buddy Tate was on the band and I was there and he sent Buddy out like a, he was like a slave. He sent him out, he called him boy all the time and it was like embarrassing, you know, it was like, I mean, Buddy was such a good, nicest cat in the world, a great player. Why is Benny treating him like that? I thought, God, this is insane. You know, Benny Joe Wilder, uh, 
Joe Wilder would not even say his name. Oh, that's right. I remember Joe talking about, yeah. about Benny, you know. He would. I think the thing with Benny was, I don't really know if Benny even had a clue to himself. I really don't know. He was such a brilliant player. I mean, what a great clarinet player, absolutely, you know. But, but I swear, when I was on the band, <coughs> I was on there twice. And the first time it was his band and I was play, I was hired in the section and Wes Hensel was hired as the lead player. Wes was the great lead player with Les Brown's band for many years back in the forties and all that stuff, you know, and Wes was a great trumpet player. He was not a jazz player, but he was a great arranger and everything. But we were at the first rehearsal and Benny kept staring at the trumpet section. And we're playing, you know, and he's just staring at the trumpet section. And I'm going like, what the hell is going on with this guy? And I was very young and, you know, kind of like green and didn't know what was going on. I was thrilled to be with Benny Goodman. But, you know, and the band was like, it was an all-star band. Georgie Ald was on the band, you know, and, uh, and uh, Lou Levy was the piano player. Colin Bailey on drums, Monty Budwig on bass. Are you kidding me? He's, I mean, Carl Fontana was on the band, Jimmy Gwynn. I mean, come on, give me a break. I mean, look at who's in this band, you know? And, but he kept staring at the trumpet section. After a while, he called a break. And this guy, uh, I think his name was Larry Grayson. He was kind of Benny's manager. He came over uh, and we were kind of just standing around and he came over to me and he said Bobby I need to talk to you and I went oh boy uh, here I go I said look Larry it's, uh, I mean he must be something about me I don't he doesn't like but it's okay I'm just going no you don't have to patronize me I'm out of here and he says oh no 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 Benny wants you on lead and I went what he said he wants you on lead he doesn't like the way Les, Wes is playing lead he moved Wes Hensel to fourth chair put me on all the lead Jack Sheldon was sitting next to me in the trumpet section. And Carl Saunders was in the section. And I had to play all the lead and all of the solos. He wouldn't let Jack Sheldon play any solos. I had to memorize all of the Harry James things on, on all of those pieces and go out front, memorize, play them. And it was like unbelievable. and. I thought, damn, I, I'm right. You mean like now, right now? <laughs> so, and then here's the other funny thing was that Jack, what he, Jack was like the comedian. He would go out front and do a little 10 minutes of comedy. Right. And when he did that, Benny would come back in the section and sit in Jack's chair. And we, Jack had some charts. So we'd play while he would back oh, him up while he sang, you know? And Benny would sit right to my left and turn like this and stare at me. Like his face is, is, is 12 inches away from my face and I'm trying to play. And Benny's sitting there looking at me like staring at me. I'm going, holy crap, you want to talk about a heartbeat? My pulse was about 500. <laughs> well, well, I'm sure he gave you a big raise for all that double duty. No, <laughs> nothing. And he never said one complimentary word to me, not once ever not once ever mm. and it was just we did four weeks at the Tropicana Hotel with that band and it was um, it was um, we had a uh, who else did we have on there oh we had Mavis Rivers as the singer mm. remember her Mavis no, I do not oh yeah she's a great singer she's from Samoa yeah she's you know Matt Catengoob the saxophone player no oh you should know him that's his mom i'll be darned she's his mom matt's a, a brilliant young saxophone player he lives in vegas and a writer and all of that he was on louis belson's band and all of that mm -hmm. anyway it was, so benny was the worst of them you know woody herman was cool except that woody could be really icy cold at times you know and uh i, I you know uh I, i've seen him downgrade Sal Nistico when we were on the band together and he and Matt Pierce wrote a ballad for Sal 
on Easy Living, I think it was. And Woody wouldn't let him play it. He wanted Sal would always do that fast <laughs> machine gun stuff. And Sal wanted to play a ballad. Woody wouldn't let him. You know, <laughs> Woody, Woody was like, he can be cruel. You know, but then one of the nicest guys I ever worked for was uh, Cy Zentner, actually, you know. Just a gentle, warm guy, friendly, cool, um, and positive, encouraging at all times. Terry Gibbs was a lot of fun to work for. You know, Terry had a few quirks here and there once in a while that, you know, he would get a hair up his butt and scream about something that was totally not <laughs> worth screaming about, you know. But, um, you know, and then, uh, then the other guy that I, Buddy Rich, of course, who I worked for, was one of the greatest experiences musically that I ever had. But one of the most intense emotional kind of nervous kind of things well you, well, you know the stories about buddy yeah. you know and talk about bipolar there's another one too you know and uh, uh you know buddy was like buddy and i he loved me and the greatest compliment i ever got in my entire career came indirectly from buddy and through his wife my wife and Marie Rich were good friends before I met my wife, actually, mm. because my wife was a dancer in Vegas and she used to dance in a show opposite the Harry James band when Buddy was on Harry's band. And so uh, we used to, after I left Buddy's band, um, Marie and my wife and I, we used to go out, get go to dinner sometimes together. And, and so uh, <laughs> the story with Marie, up to me she said buddy was on a break and he was home and she she came to him in the living room and said oh i saw i saw bobby and, and lisa shoe today and uh he said to say hello to you and, and buddy did the four letter word bobby shoe you know and uh she said why do you hate him so much he said because i've never been able to replace him and oh. she told me that and i went god I, you couldn't pat me on the back any firmer than that you know what a compliment from buddy you indeed know? those and, are some great was, records that was years after i had left the band you know i see and he had probably gone through another 10 lead players uh -huh. trying to find the right but see i used i grew up playing drums when i was 14 uh -huh. and so buddy could hear something about me knowing the drums in I my see. playing you know when i did played you, uh, did you experience like some of those long road trips on the buses. Oh boy, did we ever. How, how did you, uh, did you have any ways of dealing with that? Well, I was enjoying what I was doing. You know, I was, I was in my early twenties and funky, you know, and it was, you know, unfortunately there was a lot of drugs in those days and I was doing some of them and, so that kept us, you know, that was a focus, focal point for a lot of the guys on Buddy's band, or half of the band were using some drugs, some hard drugs and so forth. You know, there was Gene Quill was playing lead alto, uh, Pete Yowlin, Jay Corey, Marty Flax, Steve yeah. Curlow. What a saxophone section, for God's sake, you know? And all five of those guys were using hard drugs, plus myself and the bass player and and some of the other guys were just smoking weed and stuff, but that's part of the whole thing in those days, you know. I mean, I I wouldn't touch any of those things now for mm. for a truckload of hundred dollar bills, you know. I I had I cleaned up way over fifty years ago because I knew that I I suddenly realized if if I was going to play the horn to my best level, I didn't need to be all screwed up on mm -hmm. the drug, you know. I mean, you can fool yourself saying, yeah, man, me and Bird, we're into it right now, you know? No, you're not. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I was, But the good thing was that I never got, I never had any real serious problems with it. I never had any illegal issues, no police issues. Yeah. I never had any, I never got busted for anything. So I had, you know, I mean, I got out of it wisely in time, you know, but, uh, yeah. but I, I tell you what, I, the, Woody Herman's band, sometimes we would do like, we would do like 
almost about three months without almost hardly ever a night off. You know, I mean, you'd get one night off once in a while, but it would always always be in some horrible place out in the middle of nowhere you didn't want to be. You know, you know, you who who wants a night off in Lamar's Iowa? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and there was a lot less ways to distract yourself um, pre cell phone and all that stuff. Oh yeah, when you, that existed. Yeah. When you entered the um, the studio scene, was it mostly by recommendation that that you you get into that? The way it, it happened was quite unusual in that when Buddy Rich's band played and we recorded the West Side Story thing and at the at the Shea in L.A. Um, with the we were there for four weeks and. <clears throat> when we had every night every show was sold out every show for four weeks i mean it was never empty mm. and it was movie stars you'd look out there and there's judy garland she could sit up come in and sit in with the band johnny carson would sit in and play a tune with the band milton burl is right there you know all of the movie stars Edie adams bought the whole club out one night for her personal friends you know and you look at it you, it's just like you're in a movie you see all of these movie stars in the place you know but what happened was terry gibbs came in several times because he of course he loved buddy and all of that and and uh and terry liked the way i played lead trumpet and he re always remembered it and he even, even and now persino was his lead player in those days and Al was in there. That's when I first met Al. And Al was, would come backstage, you know, and hand me a pipe full of weed and, you know, nice set, kiddo, you know. And, uh, but, then, but Terry, anyway, um, the story is that I, I was living in Vegas and in, in back in those days. And um, um, Terry, uh, there were, they were doing a show called Operation Entertainment, which was like a USO entertainment show. It was a Chuck Barris uh, production, oh, you know. Oh, yeah, the gong show. The gong show guy, yeah. But he produced this show called Operation Entertainment. It was really great. And we go out every uh, every uh, for 10 days every month. And um, they, would, they did the pilot show in San Diego on an aircraft carrier. And Al was still using drugs in those days. And he nodded on the show and they had to let him go and so al persino one of the greatest lead trumpet players of all time you know and it's certainly a big influence on me you know but the thing about it was uh all, when they let al go cherry instead of calling one of the other guys in la he thought i'm gonna call that bobby shoe guy and see if he'll do these shows for me and so he called me up in Vegas and he said, can you come down to, to, you know, to L.A. and do these? And they would go to Ventura and do like the Navy base or this and that around. Then they started getting on planes and flying to Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama and, and all kinds of places around the country, you know. But so I drive my drive my uh, Porsche down to L.A. and park it at the airport and get on the plane with him and we'd go all over the place. And so I took Al's place with the with the thing. And <clears throat> that's how what because all of a sudden it's an LA band, but there's this Vegas trumpet player playing lead, you know. And all of the guys, it was Med Flory was playing lead mm -hmm. out you know, and and Frank Cap was the drummer and whatever, you know, so all these guys, Dalton Smith, Dick Forrest, Don Raider was in the section. And Slide Hyde and Charlie Loper and all of the top guys in LA, and they're all saying, "Geez, you know, who is this guy?" You know, <laughs> and then uh, right not much after that, my wife and I just got sick and tired of doing all of the Jimmy Durante and Abby Lane shows in Vegas, and we decided to move to LA and take on something different. And as soon as I got in there, I went in to hear Louis Belson's band after one of the first nights and I just ran into Louie and Louie said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, you moved here. He said, you working tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And then Chuck Finley was in the trumpet section and he, 
and Chuck, I had gotten Chuck on Buddy Rich's band when he was just out of high school. And so Chuck said, Bobby, are you, what are you doing? Are you going to stay here? I, yeah, we moved here. He says, well, man, I, I, I got a bunch of dates I need you on. And all of a sudden, Chuck was double booked and he was sending me in to cover for him on things. And I show up, I was doing like within two weeks in L.A., I was like doing a session or two almost every day. Like I was suddenly busy and guys would look at me and say, didn't you just move to town? How are you so busy all of a sudden? You know, I said, well, the just, phone just keeps ringing, you know. You should and have I, just said, well, it's talent, man. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> No, I wouldn't do that. No, the thing was, it was like, it, it got me in and people like Chuck and then John Adino and, and Rach was scary, who all these guys had known me through Buddy's band and through Woody's band and through things like that. They knew who I was, you know, and so they said, hell yes, you know, and the contractors said, okay, you know, and then and, and I, when I, when you, and of course, when you show up, you got to play and i had you know i could read really well and i had decent chops i mean i i had limitations but i didn't let anybody know what they were you know I, I, i'm i wonder if you could um get real specific for me because i've been curious about you you show up but first of all you get a call from a contractor mm -hmm. and they tell you the, the studio and the time, do you get any other information like make sure you have your mutes, bring a flugelhorn, or were you just expected to know that part of it? Part of it, you're expected to always have your mutes with you. Yeah. Uh, if a flugelhorn, not necessarily, uh, or a piccolo trumpet or anything, anything they're called doubles, as you know, uh, if they, if the contractor calls you and says, uh, bring a flugelhorn, they have to pay you for it, whether you play it or not. <laughs> I see. Okay. So if, if the call is out for the, the doubles, if, you know, if I even, when I was working at Universal, there was a, a lady there by the name of Sandy De Crescent, who was not a musician at all. She was the secretary to, uh, the guy that was the, the contractor and he committed suicide. And so the union people, mostly the string players and French horn players, you know, typically, they thought, well, uh, let's vote to have Sandy be the contractor. See, you have to be a musician in a musician's union to be a contractor. Oh. She wasn't, she was a secretary. But they thought, well, let's make her a mu musician. And so they did, They made her a maraca player <laughs> and they paid her or her they paid for her to join thinking that because they were on the list from the previous contractor that she would call them well she didn't she started calling different people and they oh. it all backfired on them but sandy became the universal studios contractor for years and she was a pain in the ass. She didn't know shit from nothing. So I, I got calls from her and told me, remind me to bring my flute and clarinet. You know? <laughs> yeah. She didn't know. And I'd go there and I'd say, you know, you used to fill out the W9 and all that. You think like, should I put flute and clarinet on here and make her pay for this, you know? <laughs> and I was like, I said, no, nah, I'm not going to do it, you know? But yeah. But, but when they, you went in, you'd go in and you'd sit down in the chair and someone would pass out the music. Did you have a routine? Uh, let me start again. I try to tell my students when they get a piece of music, you know, normally what, what younger people do is they get a piece of music and they immediately start going, blah, 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 blah. They, they look at one measure and they try to play it or something. And I'm wondering, what did you guys do to give yourself the best chance to play it and not become a, a, a two-take player? <laughs> well, I guess everybody uh, has their own approach to that. It's A lot of it has to do with your attitude with you 
if you feel confident in your sight reading skills, which I was always very good at, you know, I never had to worry. I could pretty much sight read. Uh, the only things I ever had any real complicated times with sight reading were during the disco period when everything was all 16th notes and did it, did it, do did it, do dip, do did it, did it, do it. Damn it, how many 16th rests are there in this measure? You know, <laughs> you know, and you'd have to sit there and visually like, ah, you know, so those, yeah, I, you know, you get that point. Those were difficult, but there's a way to solve it. You make an imaginary line that if it's a four, four bar down the middle of the bar and you start isolating where the where the one and the two and the three and the four are in the beat in the measure and once you see that then you can place those rest kind of things the same because then we're writing everything in like instead of eighth note sixteenths and stuff like that a lot you know and yeah. so when you start writing a sixteenth note on an and then two sixteenth rests and then another sixteenth holy crap that's only two beats you know or, or one or it's one beat or what how many wait a minute how many is that or you know, you know it almost so you sounds to... like i'm sorry it sounds like they were um trying to orchestrate what a what a guitar does a rhythm guitar like jiggy jiggy jink 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 and the drums and the percussion it's mm. like all of that music was mostly percussive music it's not very melodic is not very it's all rhythmic for the most part you know and uh i don't remember any disco tune that had a melody i wanted to sing back and come home and hmm. sing this to my wife oh where do you hear this disco song i recorded today you know it was like bip, 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 bip. <laughs> <laughs> well you just anticipated a question i have right in front of me you can't see it but the question was what kind of thing would happen uh on a studio date that you would come home and it was interesting enough to tell your wife about? Hardly ever, almost never. <clears throat> my wife could look at the, my face, the, the wrinkles in my face and tell whether I enjoyed myself or not. And she could, <laughs> she could tell. She said, another one, eh? Or something. <laughs> yeah. But I, I wanted to go back up a little bit, uh, Monk, if you don't mind, just sure. because there's a thing about about in the studio thing, it's a very, um, you know, I mean, what I had to do, what I did was different than what you were talking about, the student who sings the two measure phrase. The first thing, th there's a way of prioritizing the way you look at a piece of music that you, you're only going to see it one time. You're never going to see it again ever in your life, probably ever, you know, if you're lucky. And the, the thing about it is that the first thing you want to look at is, and a lot of people will say, look at the key signature first. Second, look at the key signature. Look at the first thing is the tempo. Find out how fast this thing is going to go first. Because if you look down and see five sharps, you go, oh my God. And then it says Largo. Oh, I'm cool. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? I you, do indeed. You like you have to know the right priorities in order to salvage yourself spiritually in the situation like that because you can you can psychologically turn yourself into a you know a banana pie if you don't watch out real quick. So like you look at the tempo, then look at the key signature, then look at the roadmap. Where are the endings? Is there a coda? Where's the coda sign? Where does it go to? Where are the repeats? like know the roadmap, you know, where you're going to get in, where you got to go back to, if at all, then you start looking in at where you see a lot of tricky measures, where you see a lot of notes in a measure, then you, that, but that's the, if you look at that first, hmm. you don't even know what tempo it's got to be yet. I see. And you haven't got the key signature sorted and you have the priorities in my, in, at least in my opinion, were tempo key signature roadmap that's first and foremost you know and then start looking at the notes and see if there's anything that looks a little scary high real lots of ledger lines or lots of, of 16th notes in a measure or a lot of funny kind of things but if you prioritize it you save yourself an awful lot of stress 
by doing it that way, you know. And the th the problems with with being in a studio is uh, when when the, the contractor or the service when the the, the uh, answering service calls you and books you on a studio and a time sometimes they'll tell you who the the writer is and sometimes they don't if you say if they say bernard herman you go oh shit get take the valium with me you know take a take a put a pint of whiskey in my horn case or something mm. because bernard herman's going to be a pain in the ass he's going to be really he's like hitler you know a real <clears throat> militant and screaming and hollering and things like that um if it's if it's um uh, jerry goldsmith it's going to be much more relaxed if it's johnny mandel it's going to be different you're going to you know and you get to where you know these people these writers and some of them like peter matz who uh i did an awful lot of with stuff with peter matz he was Barbara Streisand's conductor when I worked with her an awful lot. And Peter was like the writer on the uh, Carol Burnett show, you know, the director and all oh. that. I didn't do the Carol Burnett show, but we did Tony Orlando and Don right across the hall from him. And, but I got to know Peter really well. And Peter would come up and he'd hug you and everything. Yeah, Bobby, you know, you know, and all that where, where you could go up to some of the other ones and they didn't even know your name even after you had done a hundred sessions with them you know were, were the were the writers and arrangers always at the sessions uh not the um, kind of yes more so yes than not there the um the sometimes like for instance i did the tony randall show and and the main writer was pat williams oh but Pat wrote the theme song and then he would farm out like to ghostwriting with Sammy Nestico. <laughs> and Sammy Nestico was the writer, the ghostwriter for, for everybody out there. He and Billy Byers, Billy Byers was one of the most in, insane, greatest skilled writers I think I've ever seen in my life. Billy could sit and write a chart without a score, put it in his head and he'd come back in 45 minutes and have a thing for you done. Um, Billy was unbelievable, and Billy did stuff for Nelson Riddle and all these people. You know, a lot wow. of people, a lot of people out there got a lot of credit for shit they didn't do. <laughs> that, <clears throat> but when we did Tony Randall's show, uh, Sammy was always there because he did all of the the inside charts, the little bumper of the things. You know, when you're doing television, you you do like an opening theme, and it, at at maximum, it's a minute and a half long or two yeah. minutes long and then the closing theme while well, they put all the credits that's another minute and a half you don't play anything long it's all seven second five second bumpers scene changes you know mm -hmm. yeah, pop, 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 that's it <laughs> and you better be able to do that in one take because they don't want to do those like seven times. yeah right <laughs> but the did one... you do i imagine you did your share of um rock and roll dates i did yeah i and yeah. thank god i did because TV doesn't pay anything. Uh, no there's kidding. no there's no royalties in television. I did if if I had the shows that I did like Love Boat, uh, Hawaii Five O, Eight's Enough, Mark and Mindy. The list goes on. If you would not believe it, you know, if you saw the list of shows that I did, um, Mission Impossible, whatever. The list is is ridiculous. And there's no royalties paid on TV for musicians. Everybody else gets paid. The producers, the guy that go, mops the floor and goes out for sandwiches gets paid. But there was a problem going on with the AF of M years and years and years ago with negotiations for re new contracts. And they just didn't want to pay the increase in salaries and health and welfare and pension fund and stuff like that. So they they argued and argued and argued and took it to court and the musicians lost. And they, we formed a thing called the overseas TV reports and all that we're trying to get, but I can go to like, you know, Tanganyika and turn on TV and see Love Boat with me playing it and in another language, but 
and everybody's getting paid. All of the actors are getting paid, the producers, but I'm not getting paid. And that is a horrible thing for the musicians. But I did an awful lot of, uh, <clears throat> a fair amount of rock and roll things. You know, I did, um, well, I, I recorded stuff with Elvis. I recorded with Neil Diamond. I did things with the tubes, you know. Uh, oh, the uh, tubes. You know, well, whatever, yeah. And uh, different, and Willie Nelson and people like that, you know. And the good thing is when you record for, for recording for LPs and CDs and stuff like that, you get royalties, you know, you get okay. AFM royalties. So I'm at this point, having retired now, I do get uh, royalty payments for the, the things that I get for rock and roll records and all of the motion picture soundtracks that I did, which was probably about a hundred and some movie soundtracks. Wow. Were those so, rock and roll dates different? Um, did you ever show up to do a date and there was no music? Like you were expected to come up with horn parts? Boy, did I ever. Yeah, a lot of them are like that. And and uh, this uh, there was this one guy, what the hell was his name? I may, I've suppressed his name purposely, I guess. But he, he, I would show up, myself and the saxophone player would show up and they'd have all these rhythm tracks. And um, you'd start listen to them and then you'd, what do you guys feel? What do you feel? What do you feel? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you'd have to sit there and how about this? Dup, da -dup, da -dup, da -dup. Oh yeah. I like that. I like that. So we'd looking at each other going, let's get the, let's get this done and get the hell out yeah, of here. Yeah. I've had that experience. I wonder if when you had to do that, was there a vocal you were hearing? Sometimes. Be yeah. Okay. Cause you don't want to be, you don't want to get Creating in the way. Horn. Yeah, you don't want to be getting in the way, right? Well, the other thing is, I did one one time for this one guy, and uh, <clears throat> I can't remember his name, but he's a he was a noteworthy uh, producer out there, uh, rock and roll guy. I, I never paid those people. I did not enjoy working with very much, but this guy, uh, he heard that I played trombone also, so. I had to bring my trombone in there and my trumpet and a flu horn. And when I got in there, there was nothing but a track. And so we'd figure out, and I'd have to figure it all out by my ear. And I'd sing it to him and I'd put my horn and I'd put a mute in and I'd play along with the track in the booth. And he'd say, yeah, yeah, that's good right there. I like that, that's the good, uh, yeah. <laughs> No, 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 let's leave it out. Let's leave that open right there. And I'd go through it a few times. I'm trying to remember what the hell did I do, you know? <laughs> and you have to go in there and I, but you, the good thing about that is that they stop the tape and they can go back and keep punching in and punch out. And so one track would take a whole afternoon, like four hours or five hours, because I would put, finally put the first trumpet part on the way we wanted it. Then I'd go back in and put a second trumpet part on and maybe a third trumpet part on. And then I'd pick up the trombone and I'd put on three trombone parts and I would build an entire brass section by myself. The good news about that is I, for every person that I record for, I have to get paid as an individual. So I got paid six salaries for an afternoon. And one salary for a session would be say, like 450 or $500. So you're making like three grand for an afternoon, you know? Mm. Not well, that, that helps, even though you might've had wrinkles on your forehead. It, it does pay <laughs> for, it. A, it pays for a lot of leaves and ad bills. And, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I have to tell you one time I was doing a thing at Universal and in the trumpet section, you know, uh, it's a funny thing that Dalton Smith, who was a great guy to, play with, you know, and uh, work with all the time, of, you know, Stan Kenton's lead player for a while. But sometimes they used to write stuff so high and ridiculously hard for me. I'd finish it and I'd get it done, but I'd go, Christ, why do I be writing like this for me? And, oh my God, you know. And Dalton said, you know, one time, he said, there's an exercise that you can do. He said, if you do that exercise, it, it saves your chops and you can last forever. And I said, Really? I need to know what is that exercise is. He says, here, you play this and you play that. You know? 
Oh, oh that's so. a good one. I, I, it, you don't find, they don't teach you that in music school. <laughs> no, they don't. So I, uh, I was doing the thing at Universal Studios one day, and it was just like some sort of a, a silly movie about like the late 20s or early 30s or something. And there was a, there was a scene where there was a little kind of a John Philip Sousa tiny band on a gazebo in a park and people were all walking through in the Sunday afternoon, you know, and they're, they're, they're dressed up and all of that. And you turn the page and there's Carnival of Venice. What? <laughs> and why the writer had to put that there. He could have put anything there, but he had, this was somebody said, Oh, I'm going to put Carnival of Venice. So it's like, you must hate trumpet players, you know, to, to make, all of a sudden you turn the page and there's this thing well i couldn't play that thing ever in my life not now and not then because i never took any lessons as a kid i never learned to double tongue or triple tongue i had no classical training whatsoever you know other than playing marches in my high school band that was it you know and other than that i i was just a jazz guy and a big band person so I played in some salsa bands, but I couldn't double that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I looked at that thing, and and there's Warren Looning sitting right next to me. I went, "You, you got it." <laughs> and Warren had done all of that. He had done all that stuff, and just passed the part to him, and he nailed it, it just like the old Del Stegers one. And it was not the entire thing, but it was enough of it that I couldn't have played it, uh -huh. not in a million years. When we did the, the Tony Randall show, the the theme, we get there to the first session, the theme's a piccolo trumpet. What the hell? Nelson Hat. Here you go, Nelson. And <laughs> that, so you pass the part because yeah. you, 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 you got to keep, one of the things is that it's very important in those situations is you cannot go in there with an ego issue you're asking for trouble if you do because ego is really simply defined as self-importance when you may oh i am important and i have to do this and i'm going to brag about because i did that well you're going to shit all over that piccolo trumpet part and everybody on the planet is going to know who sucked on that piccolo thing on tony randall's show oh that was shoe i should have figured you know <laughs> but <laughs> they said no we can say no Shoe passed the part to Nelson Hat. Oh, that shoe is a smart cookie, you know. <laughs> and so, you got to keep your ego completely out of the picture when you go into those things. Sometimes, and and I got caught one time on a film, TV movie about some inconsequential invasion of bees in an Indiana small village. Who knew? It was not important, but. There was only one trumpet on the thing and I turned the page and there was a whole bunch of double tonguing and I tried to do it and I, I really couldn't do it. I could not handle it. And I went, Oh God, you got 30 seconds to get it ready. And so I did it one time and <clears throat> it was terrible. And the conductor goes, Hey, two. Oh, you want to hear that again? <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going, Oh crap. And so I, I couldn't do it. And, and he and he stopped and he looked at me and he says, "Is there a problem, sir?" And I said, "Me and my big mouth, I had to say, man, it's not my bag, you dig." And he threw the baton at me. Ooh. And this is in front of like an eighty-piece orchestra, and I'm the only trumpet. And the contractor was Gus Klein, who was Manny Klein's son, you know. And Gus is a good guy, but I lean. lean Gus leans over, he says, Bobby, what the hell are you doing? I said, what are you doing putting me on a session like this? You know, but he doesn't know. The contractor doesn't know what the music is. He just gets a call from the writer and <clears throat> he's not looking at the parts. He doesn't go through everybody's part and says, oh, we can't hire Bobby for this. There's a double tongue on that one page, you know? So they hire you and, and you're expected to be able to be the most eclectic guy on the planet. You got to walk in there and do everything. So what happened is I had to go out and talk to the guy and I apologize and everything. And I, I said, look, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be, I said, but it intimidated me. You know, and you, when you throw a baton at me, it doesn't make it easier. I said, so I'll go in there now and I'm going to figure out how to play this thing for you. But 
if it requires that I pay for the entire orchestra for an extra hour, I will pay it $10,000, but I'm not going to take a baton in the face. Well, money is not that important to me if it, that's what it's going to take. So I walked in there and I sat down and everybody was like looking at me like, ooh, you know. And I walked over there and I looked at that thing and I thought, how in the hell am I going to do this, you know? And then I remembered when I got out of high school, I went back to New York and I used to go out and listen to Kenny Dorham and Roy Eldridge and all these guys play. And they used to do, I used to watch Kenny Dorham. He used to do a thing with alternate fingerings and he'd do things like this. And I went, damn, how does it do that? And I messed around and I went alternate fingering. So I went in there and I put a mute in and I practiced this page using alternate fingerings and <clears throat> until I could do it. And the guy came in and he looked at me, he said, are we ready? And I said, yes, sir, we are. And everybody in the orchestra looked like, what? He learned to double tongue that fast, you know? And I did it and the guy thought I double tongued it. He never knew that I was only using alternate fingerings like that. And on the trumpet, there's a lot of them. And if you know them, you can bullshit your way right through it. And that well, was, I walked out of that studio that day like, oh, you know, <laughs> God. Well, you you kind of said it earlier in the interview that you you got to keep your wits about you, and uh, if you know if you had like freaked out, you probably wouldn't have had that memory of of seeing those guys do that alternate fingering. Well, yeah, but I think the thing is you have to learn to think on your feet, you know. Yeah. And um, I mean, I I encourage the students that, that study with me now, especially if they're in school. I. I'm caught in between two realities on this. One of them is being eclectic and learning to play all styles while you're young. That means study classical music, yes. Learn to double, triple tongue, yes. You know, learn to transpose, yes. Can, if you have to play a C trumpet, I'll go, okay, get one, but you know, but whatever. But become, you have to be prepared and if you, you're, you know, 100% that doesn't exist, perfect doesn't exist, but you walk into those situations out there in a studio and you're just like the utility guy. You walk in, you knowing not what you're going to run into. Uh, and you have to just be ready for, for whatever can happen. And sometimes it just, like that situation with me with the alternate fingerings, I who I don't know how I managed to come up with that, but mm -hmm. but the fact that I did saved my ass. It saved my career. I mean, I could have, I could have been really, you know. Once they, they say, there, there's a funny little story I'll give you. The, the, uh, a musician are talking to a contractor and they say, the contractor, have you heard this new guy in town, Bobby Shue? No, I haven't heard of him. No, no, never heard of him. What's his name, Bobby Shue? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's uh, he's, he's quite a player. Um, I, yeah, I was. I went to a session with him last week, and God, he came in, sight read everything, just played beautifully and uh, lyrically and everything. And then I was on a session the next day, and he was playing up in the upper register like Maynard. He played, God, I couldn't believe it. Everybody was saying, wow, this guy, Bobby Shue, what's his, his name's Bobby Shue. Yeah, you got to know him. No, contract. I never heard of him. Never heard of him. And uh, then uh, a couple of days ago, I was on a session and and he chipped a high D. Oh, I did hear about that. <laughs> 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 you know, and this is one of the things about it. The studio situation is is that as long as you're okay, you're okay. But the That's minute you start chipping. The words all over town in a minute. I mean, wow. it really gets out. And that's like, it's so competitive, uh, Monk, you know, that there's, for every chair open for a trumpet, there's 300 guys sitting there wishing they were on it. Mm -hmm. You know? And there's a, there's a lit, all the contractors have priority lists, you know? And, and sometimes there's some of the musicians 
I won't say any names here, but one of the reasons I quit the studios in 1982 is because there were a couple of musicians that came in that were trying to control who was being called on sessions. And uh, this one guy, for instance, uh, he would get a call from the service, said, well, you're such and such for such and such day and such and such hours. And he'd say, well, who else is in the trumpet section? Well, Bobby Shue and uh, Dalton Smith. Really? Tell the contractor, put me on hold and tell the contractor to call me. So the contractor would call. So what, is there an issue? And he'd say, is it true that you really want Bobby Shue and Dalton Smith on the session? The contractor would say, well, what is your problem? He'd say, well, I don't want to say anything bad about Oof. those guys, you know. He's already said it. Yeah. And well, he, the contractor would say, well, who do you want? And he'd say, well, can you get my friend here and this other friend of mine, you know, because we went to school together or we had the same teacher or something like that. And this, you know, Dalton Smith and Bobby Shue are getting a cancellation, you see. And this kind of stuff happens and you get a, a couple of egomaniacal idiots who start to try to manipulate other people's right to put beans and rice on the table and provide new shoes for their kids. And we're all in this thing together. Back in the early days, when I first started doing sessions, it was a really good brotherhood. People, one guy would be sick, his wife would be sick. We'd all throw him dates just so he could make some money to help pay for the medical bills or something. And everybody was a brotherhood trying to look it out for each other and yeah. nobody would ever backstab anybody. But it was like the, the rock and rollers that got into it. Those kind of guys got mm. a different attitude. You know, the, I think what, when we started this conversation, we were talking about the emotional relationship with the music, the human part of this whole thing. And when you get into it, when it's only a money thing and it's only an ego thing and only hey, you see, I'm on this record, I'm on that record. You see who, that's me playing this, that's me playing that, you know? When you get into all of that, the whole thing, change, the game changes and it becomes like, you know, you got to keep your back to the wall. You, there's certain people you just don't want to be around, you know? And and uh, that's a sad thing. It's a, it's a real horrible shame, but I think why, in my opinion, for whatever that's worth, I think an awful lot of this goes back to what I was saying to you about the problems in the educational system is they make more and more and more about the perfection, don't miss any notes kind of thing. And they change the priorities around it. It's all about ego and money and, and not missing any notes and see how high I can play. And, it, you know, and I hear guys now and I won't, I heard a, a video, a thing just this two or three hours ago, Somebody sent me a, a video of a trumpet player, a young trumpet player. And I listened to him. God, he's got fingers and chops like you can't believe. But it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Oh. It's like it's like a million notes for what reason? Uh -huh. You know, and it, I re it reminded me of a of a, a uh, lecture that I have on cassette. It's an interview with Coleman Hawkins. And uh, by an English guy, when Coleman was over in Britain and this guy interviewed him and, and Coleman says on the, on the cassette, he says, he says, you know, I spent my entire life trying to figure out what not to play. <laughs> you know? And it's, well. it's kind of like, as you go, as you grow older and so forth, you start to, I go back and listen to things I recorded 30 or 40 years ago. And I'm thinking, Oh God, what was I thinking? You know? oh. Yeah. Too many. Well. Notes. Too much. Well, Bobby, this has been great. I'm so glad that you could uh, get together with me this afternoon. And I, I'm going to wrap up by a, uh, testing your memory. Okay. Um, at the age of 12, I believe you broke your piggy bank so you could buy three records. <laughs> and do you remember what those three records were? Dave Brubeck's first album on Fantasy Record. Uh... Stan Getz with strings and uh, a J.J. Johnson album. Yes, indeed. And I, I was so blown away. And I never heard a trumpet player yet. 
and not a jazz player. Well, I had heard Harry James on a 78, but not realizing, you know. But uh, the first jazz trumpet player that I heard was Don Fagerquist with the Les Brown band. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, what the heck is that? You know, and and I had, then I started buying all the Les Brown albums so I could listen to Don. And then uh, years later, uh, I with when he was all with the Dave Fell Octet, I bought yeah. all of those. And then after Don had passed away, I Dave called me up. I took Don's chair in the Dave Fell Octet. So I thought, that's great. Good God. It well, so after we're after we're done here, I want you to go back and uh, see if those three records are still in your three thousand LP collection. <laughs> They are. Okay. And there, there's a guy coming here from New York in about a week and a half, and he's going to go through yeah. them and pick out some collectibles and buy them from me, you know. I've yep. got to, I've, I don't listen to that much vinyl anymore because uh, <clears throat> a lot of those things I've got replaced onto CD now, and so yes. it's easier to pull out a CD, and, right. and I, don't, I don't climb a ladder very well, and most of them are way up, way over there yeah. in that that high corner over there but anyway monk it's always a great man thank you so much i'm so flattered that you you uh, contact me for these things you know i've i've watched several of your other uh interviews you know i've uh you know gone to the link and gone out there and listened to them i started with both of dennis de blasio's and okay i started going from there and there's some there's some very very interesting uh conversations you've had with some yeah some i'm gonna recommend i'm gonna recommend one for you okay go uh gerald wilson and snooki young i've seen it sitting together yeah I, that was I, I've, yeah i've seen that yeah yeah That's, that was a thrill well i mean for me i was on gerald's band playing yeah. the lead chair for a while and then snooki young stood next to me on louis belson's band for right long time and he was also uh we were in uh, bill berry's band together and also in the juggernaut nat pierce frank cat band together. Yeah. i love i love snooki my, my three fra favorite lead trumpet players in the world was snooki al Persino, and conrad gazzo and anybody that's going to learn to play lead trumpet better study those three guys because okay. everybody else comes from those three you know all right anyway thank okay. you so much John. thank you very much